welcome uh, the people who just joined us on YouTube. Um, um, sorry for the five minute late start and let's ignore that I was already like five minutes into my talk when you guys joined us. Um, cool, uh, so let's start this again. Um, so if you're only joining us on YouTube, note that you can ask questions in the Berlin XMPP, uh, XMPP channel and a link to that channel you can find uh, down below in the YouTube video description. Um, and yeah, before I start my talk, I want to give a small disclaimer um, that um, yeah, audio video calls are really complex and I feel like they have like 10 layers of complexity to them and I'm only like two layers deep into, uh, into the topic. Um, so yeah, to anyone who knows more on the topic, like I'm sorry for maybe making one or two small mistakes. Um, so yeah, um, making audio and video calls like or any form of real time media is a little bit more involved than one would maybe naively think. And um, yeah, you have to do do a whole bunch of things for a reliable real time uh, communication. Um, like first of all, you have to like establish the connection in in general, and you have to bypass maybe nets or other kinds of firewalls. And then you constantly have to manage your bandwidth, bandwidth which might be fluctuating over the period of of the call and um, like depending what route the packages take through the internet. Um, yeah, the bandwidth might vary. And then you also have to like control the stream and like deal with package loss and uh, make sure that the audio and video, if you're doing audio video calls and not just audio calls, stay in sync. And um, then you might all, like even though like in general you're using uh, UDP, which contrary to TCP doesn't like ensure that every single package uh, arrives on the other end, you still might want to implement um, some kind of recent uh, behavior. For example, this video, you might want to recent like keyframes and stuff like that, uh, but you might not want to like recent like intermediate frames because by the time you have like requested uh, the package that contains that frame uh, to be sent again, it might have already been in the past. And yeah, on top of that, you also uh, ideally want to encrypt the media that you're sending through the internet. Um, and on the client side, um, you obviously have to. Sorry for with... interrupting, but it's difficult to listen. Somebody is typing and forgot to mute. No, he's muted. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so, so on the client side, you have to deal with encoding, uh, decoding, and ideally uh, that uh, encoding would be hard to accelerate it and then the playback. And um, you also have to deal with like noise and echo cancellation and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, all that is to say it's a, um, little bit more complicated than just encoding your own voice and sending it down a TCP stream or whatever. And actually, if you want to know a little bit more about that topic, there's a, a great YouTube video on the a computer file um, uh, channel, which um, like dedicates a full half hour to just like stream control and bandwidth management and, and stuff like that. So um, that, that also goes to show on how complex the topic is. So there's a full half hour of content just for one bullet point on one, one of my slides. Um, so um, as you can imagine, like for all those different problems that I just described. There are a multitude of protocols or solutions for that. And like, if you have like multiple solutions for each individual point in the stack, then you can imagine that there's like an almost indefinite amount of uh, ways to combine um, 
those different protocols and those different solutions. And this is the point where WebRTC comes in. So um, WebRTC is actually like a web um, standard um, that says like to do audio video calls or to do any kind of real time communication, use exactly that protocol to solve X and use the other protocol to solve Y and, and so on. And like uh, the combination of protocols that WebRTC shows, uh, ICE or interactive connectivity establishment uh, for like bypassing uh, through firewalls and net and getting like the underlying UDP connection working and then RTP uh, for like the audio video synchronization and getting that part of, of the stack done. And then it uses like uh, DTLS SRTP for encryption. And in WebRTC, it even says like it is required to do that. You can't turn it off or anything. And um, then the negotiation, like where both parties agree on what um, codex they support and on um, what IP addresses they are listening on and stuff like that, that happens through the uh, session description protocol or STP for short. And all those um, four protocols that I just mentioned are ITF standards. So uh, WebRTC actually like builds on top of like ex ex existing RFCs. Uh, yeah, and when it comes uh, to media, um, um, Actually, Holger, you started sharing your screen, and now this is the focus of of um, the, the presentation. I'll, so I'll stop immediately. I wasn't uh, expecting that <laughs> to, make, to change the focus. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me neither. No worries. Um, yeah, and, and when it actually comes down to media, um, it, it's a little bit flexible in WebRTC, so the SDP allows you to theoretically like negotiate any kind of on codec, codex for both uh, audio and video that you want to use. Um, but the standard also requires you to uh, support Opus for audio and then both VP8 and H.264 uh, for video. And um, yeah, it's actually both or two uh, video codecs in there because I mean, if some of you remember the component code, um, Codec wars between Google and uh, basically the entire rest of the world, on where Google wanted something like patent free and everyone else was already on H.264. Anyway, so now the standard has essentially two, uh, two video codecs in there. Um, but optionally, you can also negotiate like other things. For example, um, on the Chromium browser, on the Google side of things, there's already support for VP9 in there. Uh, or potentially you could uh, negotiate uh, H.265 with that. Um, or like in the future, um, you might be able to negotiate uh, AV1. Um, but yeah, for now, like um, Opus and VP8 slash H.264 are like the lowest common denominator that everyone has to um, support. Um, so that brings us to lib, lib web RTC. Um, so what is lib web RTC? Lib web RTC is one implementation of uh, web RTC. Um, and it's the implementation that is used in the Chrome browser, but it's also the, so to say the original implementation. Um, so originally it was developed by like a company, the company then was bought by Google and, um, was like originally called libjingle and even existed at the times of gtalk when gtalk was still a thing and uh, as far as i know like the times of gtalk and libjingle actually predate like the standardization of web rtc um, um so yeah and, and the binary of the lib web rtc library is still like uh called libjingle.so and yeah and google when they were still invested in xmpp actually um, had to create some of the uh, 
uh, jingle zaps that, that we are using um, today. Um, but yeah, LibWebRTC is not uh, just an implementation of the protocol stack that I mentioned earlier. It also includes all the client side code. Um, so like everything you need um, for capturing audio and video. So the part that like from your webcam to the library essentially, and it takes care of the encoding, the decoding down to the rendering of the frames on screen. And it also does a lot of heavy lifting with like the echo cancellation, the noise reduction and everything. Um, so yeah, when you want to implement it, like WebRTC uh, is a huge magic black box that does that takes a lot of work off your hands. Um, so yeah, it, it, it essentially does everything um, from codec selection to like candidate selection, which is um, deciding what network paths to use or what network connections to use down to like even playing audio. So um, it's not like you're getting like a PCM stream or whatever and then have to play it yourself. Like on Android, it literally plays the audio, the incoming audio um, for you. And um, when you use the library, you actually have like very little public methods that you actually have to use. Um, I think to get a like working on a WebRTC connection with LibWebRTC going, you have to call like four different methods or something like that. Um, and that's essentially it. It And the rest is all done by um, libwebrtc. The obvious downside of that is that if something goes wrong, you don't really know why. Um, and it, it's also like uh, rather badly documented. Um, Someone hasn't muted themselves. Could you please mute yourself? Okay, cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so LibWebRTC itself is like not very well documented, uh, but it follows, like it's very close to the browser APIs that you would use if you were to use like JavaScript in your browser. So if you're reading like a how-to or documentation on how to use like the browser APIs, then you can like, transpile that knowledge essentially to how to use uh, libwebrtc. And yeah, so uh, like I said, it has like about four public methods. And then what you get out of libwebrtc is essentially like a block, like a huge string of SDP. And if you remember like SDP's session description protocol, that's like all the um, textual information that you then need to send to the other party and they feed it into their WebRTC, if you will, and then like the connection, quote unquote, magically appears. And um, so, yeah, WebRTC, like the web standards, is like totally agnostic on how you would transport that SDP to the other party. And yeah, uh, when you when we use, um, uh, let me let me show you this very quickly. And um, this is how um, SDP would look like. I'm like, oh, that's the output that you would get from WebRTC or, or LibWebRTC. And this is actually like very heavily redacted. Um, there's only like, I don't know, a quarter of the SDP that um, that you would have if you were to negotiate like audio calls. Sorry, Daniel, could you inform mm -hmm. Thunder Green that he has his cam on? I guess he does not want that. Okay. Yeah, I guess he just heard you, but yeah, Sander Green, please turn off your webcam if you if you if you're not comfortable with that, or at least notice that you have your webcam on and might be streamed as a consequence to that. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that's the SDP output, and um, obviously, if we if you want to use uh, XMPP, we have to. Um, transforms that output to uh, something XMPP, so something more XML looking. And yeah, that's actually like, if you want to implement audio video calls, uh, that's actually like a huge chunk of the work. And um, so yeah, like everything we saw in the previous slides um, maps to um, different kind of zaps uh, in one way or the other. And um, so there are a bunch of 
absolutely a required zap that like both you and the other party have to support and, and that's to communicate like the very uh, baseline of things and yeah that's um, you can see it on, on screen that's like one step for the actual RTP things and one to like communicate um, uh, the network connections um, like on what ports or on what IP addresses you're listening on and then there's another one um, to negotiate um, the encryption, um, uh, DTLS, SRTP in our case. And as I said before, um, WebRTC absolutely requires that description, uh, that, that encryption, so you cannot uh, turn it off. And that's why um, we are listing um, the DTLS, SRTP, um, ZEP as as a required um, extension, which the other party absolutely has to support if they wanted to um, uh, communicate with a client that uses um, libwebrtc or webrtc as a backend. And then there are other um, extensions um, that all map like different SDP attributes to XML essentially. And um, so the, the layman thing behind that is the more extensions uh, you support, uh, the better quality uh, you get. Um, like for example, like the um, uh, jingle feedback negotiation thing, uh, if uh, both you and the other parties support that, um, um, then like the error correction on the stream uh, works a little bit better, for example. Um, which I mentioned like on the very first slide as um, uh, stream control. That's what's uh, handled in that extension. And um, then for example, like the jingle grouping framework, um, this maps to what um, the WebRTC vocabulary calls uh, bundles. And this is actually um, when you combine both the audio and the video into like one transport uh, RTP connection. Like otherwise, if you wouldn't be bundling or grouping that, uh, you would have like one uh, RTP stream for audio and one RTP stream for video. And like, yeah, the jingle grouping framework uh, allows you to uh, do that in one, uh, in, in one RTP session. And yeah, so um, when I started looking into that, um, the uh, state of these apps was surprisingly clear and, and straightforward. They were, um, like the base apps um, were very easy to understand and more or less like relatively well established in the community or in like other existing implementations, I guess. And then like all the bonus apps, like the extension apps, are all like relatively straightforward mappings of SDP attributes um, to um, XML essentially, or to, to um, jingle extensions. Um, so yeah, um, it, it's, it's all relatively easy. You don't even really have to understand um, what like the underlying SDP does or what you are actually negotiating. You just have to understand how to like transform the SDP or, output to Jingle and vice versa. And the uh, Zeps do a pretty good job at explaining um, you how. Um, so most of these Zeps were already in um, draft state when I started looking into that. A bunch of the extensions, like including like DTLS, were not. There were still experimental Zeps. Um, but I actually, like because I'm also on the XMPP council, I started like um, the last call um, for those steps and um, the vast majority of them that I caught already went through with um, little but very positive feedback. And now um, all but one, I believe, is um, are now draft. And the other one is basically in the process of becoming draft. Um, the only like very a uh, little bit unclear or funny bit was um, that in the original jingle zap. Uh, so if I go back a slide in uh, um, 
167, like in the jingle RTP sessions, Zep. Um, um, most implementations in the wild were using like an element called RTCP MUX, but that wasn't like documented in the Zep. Like everyone was using it, but it, it wasn't like explained anywhere. Um, and what that actually does is, um, so usually your um, audio or your, your media and the control for that media, so control meaning on changing resolutions or please resend the last frame or whatever, usually that goes through yet another um, connection. Um, but muxing is like sending like the control and the media over the same stream. And yeah, like WebRTC uses that and like every, almost every implementation that I uh, looked into use, used that element, but it wasn't documented. And um, yeah, I, I simply changed it. I actually found like a pull request from, uh, I, I think like five years ago or something like that, where like someone like added the element to the zap, but never like, submitted the pull request or something like that. Um, whatever, but, but that has been fixed now as well. And now the zap reflects like, or documents that element as well. Um, so yeah, what, what, what that does um, by, by using that WebRTC stack is that you as a client developer are like almost instantly compatible with um, like, everyone else who uses the same stack. So um, any implementation that uses like WebRTC or like the protocols used by WebRTC will be like more or less instantly uh, compatible. Um, so moving was almost instantly compatible with just some minor bug fixes that we had to do. Uh, and then Siskin and Beagle also were like almost instantly compatible. Um, so there were nothing, nothing major that we had to change on either side. Uh, it was mostly just bug fixing and um, actually like fixing stuff on the XMPP layer or in the way that we negotiate things, but not really like nothing on the heavy list lifting side or nothing like in the um, library or, or whatever. Um, but it also means um, that we are, not compatible um, with people who like make different decisions that uh, that are not like in WebRTC. Um, so as I said, like in the very beginning of my talk, um, for each of the problems that um, audio and video calls have, there are multiple solutions available, right? And um, so like, especially before web WebRTC actually became a thing, like some implementations uh, might have picked um, different solutions to the problems. Like for example, um, theoretically you don't have to use um, like RTP or ICE, you can also like just send it over UDP sockets. Um, and then implementations that do that won't probably ever be compatible with, with conversations. And also like when it comes down to encryption, um, there are like competing encryption negotiations, like for example, like ZRTP, which once was a thing. And if um, the other implementations use that, uh, conversations won't be compatible with uh, that. Or for that matter, like any implementations that uses like the WebRTC stack won't be compatible um, with that. Or like even if you are using like SRTP without um, like the DTLS part, um, so DTLS is actually like um, the key handshake part of that. And you could use SRTP without using like DTLS. And if your um, implementation were to do that, then it's also like not compatible um, with anything that uses like WebRTC. Because again, as I said before, um, so um, the WebRTC unfortunately is a little bit of a black box. So even if you wanted to, get it to send like unencrypted data to be comp more compatible with other solutions. We can't, we can't really extract that from libwebrtc without like patching the library. Um, 
Right. Yeah. And and, and for example, like Monal, like the iOS client Monal is one of the um, examples that um, uses something like more home home root uh, and not WebRTC based. So like Mona, at least in its current state, is not going to be compatible um, with with uh, conversations. Um, but yeah, notice here that I say like compatible with WebRTC or the stack that the suite of protocols that WebRTC uses. It doesn't require you to lose uh, to use libwebrtc because libwebrtc is just one implementation of the protocol stack, and you could theoretically like reproduce uh, the same stacks that webrtc uses by like re-implement re-implementing um, like each protocol by uh, by yourself, and that's for example like what what Jitsi does, not Jitsi Meet, but Jitsi the desktop um, or the Java app. And that's also like uses ICE and uh, DTLS, SRTP, and stuff like that, but not through libwebrtc, but like by by doing it themselves. Um, so we might actually have a chance to at some point get get compatibility with Jitsi, the desktop client, um, but not right now because like there are currently bugs on the um, negotiation level. So like they are sending like weird XML. Or like the wrong XMPP, so that's why we are currently not compatible uh, with Jitsi, and that's only like the first issue that I found. Maybe there are more, just like the first one. And we have like similar things with a talk, like the other Android client, which I believe also uses the same or similar libraries or similar stacks in Jitsi. Um, and yeah, so um, all I said of uh, until this point, um, it's all like peer-to-peer -peer connections, so between two devices, and you negotiate all that, like what ports you're using, like what codecs you want to use over Jingle, which is like a suit of zips on XMPP, and you're doing that over IQs, like direct device-to-device -device, um, communication. Uh, but if you want to be fancy, um, if you want to call someone, we want that all of their devices will be ringing, then they can pick it up on whatever the device they want. And that's um, where Jingle message initiation comes in. And that's uh, something that you do before negotiating the actual Jingle stuff via IQs. And you first like send a message to all uh, their devices or to their account, and then it gets distributed to all of their devices. Uh, basically with a simple message uh, saying like what kind of jingle session you want to start, like whether you want to start a video call or an audio call. Um, yeah, and then you get the cool thing uh, that I'm sure you have all like experienced with uh, with conversations that it rings on all your de devices and then you can pick up and the other device stops ringing. And it also gives you the ability uh, to potentially have a record of your calls in, in your archive. Um, and also, like, because IQs are al always directed to a specific device, and with like message initiation, you could potentially send it even to offline devices, which then would, for example, on iOS or on other mobile devices, hopefully wake up that device, and then the device like can fetch uh, the pending jingle message initiations from MAM and like do whatever is necessary. Um, so yeah, and that that was also like implemented um, in conversations from day one and also like Movem used it. And uh, I, I think for Cisco and on iOS, they're currently working on, on implementing that. Um, but it's also like while the other jingle zaps were mostly done, like the jingle message initiation Zap is like the most incomplete, most not ready to use. Um, Zap, there are like a couple of things in there that, um, yeah, will require us to like, or, or are required to be reworked and a little bit uh, cleared up. Um, for example, it's currently like lacking a feature uh, where you can tell whether or not the other party supports that. And it also doesn't have anything on tie breaks. Um, uh, Jingle itself has something on tie breaks, and tie breaks are when two people uh, are calling each other uh, simultaneously. Then you 
don't want the things that you get on normal telephony networks where like both of them are indicated as busy, but you just want the call to connect, right? And then if you have two competing uh, sessions coming in and then you have to decide which one to pick and um, Jingle has rules on how to handle that, um, but Jingle message initiation doesn't yet, or it's, at least it's not clear on how to do that. And that's something that we would have to put into this app before we can move it on to draft. Uh, but as far as like end users are concerned, it like kind of works, kind of works out all right. And yeah, that actually brings me um, to the last slide. And before I um, uh, give the mic off to Holger, uh, who's going to tell us more about the networking side of things. Um, so as I already said on the first slide, in most cases, um, you will be behind firewalls or behind a net or whatever, and that will require at least some level of server-side assistance um, where either the server will tell you your external IP or like in the worst case, like even route the entire traffic. And because it requires server-side assistance, um, you as a client need to figure out um, where to get that server-side assistance from or like where the server parts or the servers stun and turn that's um, the uh, technical term for that are located on, on what IP address they're listening to. And um, yeah, to do that, there's actually like a zap uh, called external service discovery where you can ask your own server, oh, please go ahead, tell me where I can find uh, stun and turn servers. Um, but uh, that zap really wasn't deployed in the wild. Like even though there are currently clients out there or there were clients out there before conversations was that do audio video calls with WebRTC, none of them implemented like that discovery that they all uh, either didn't uh, implement like stun or turn at all, which makes calls not work or hard code like the Google's uh, server or let's the user configure it, which um, all three are like terrible uh, ways of handling that. And yeah, so um, I mean, in conversations, I really dislike settings and I really dislike delegating tasks to the user. Um, uh, so yeah, that's why we, I mean, the ZEP existed, but mm, the implementations really didn't exist. And that's why to make audio video calls um, happen in conversations, we needed to make uh, the ZEP happen. And yeah, so this is the part where Holger is going to tell you a little bit more about stun and turn and the networking stuff. And okay, thank you. I'm gonna mute myself now and uh, hand it off to Holger. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, hi, everyone. Um, let's see what I can get the screen shared again. Yeah, it looks good, right? Um, OK, yeah. So I'm Olga. One of the things I'm doing is uh, working on uh, EJOD. And uh, I implemented this missing part Daniel mentioned in, on his last slide uh, uh, for EJOD a few weeks ago, back uh, triggered by conversations, uh, adding audio video support. Um, and uh, well, first of all, everyone who joined uh, who joined the video conference, please feel free to ask any questions right away. I'm totally fine with that. But uh, don't forget that you'll be recorded by YouTube. Um, I figured I'd start by um, explaining the problem. So to to recap, Jingle, as Daniel explained, is used for negotiating the audio video streams. Uh, it's used for initiating the call, letting your contact accept or reject the call. It's used for negotiating the RTP parameters and the stream encryption. And at this point, at this point on my slides, what's missing is the actual connection to transmit the, the configured streams. Um, 
you could say clients already have a connection between each other by means of XMPP. They can exchange messages. They can uh, exchange the jingle communication. But that's not usable for transporting the actual audio video streams because that would be way too uh, slow. It would, would add way too much latency. So a separate connection must be established for that, as Daniel already explained. The optimal solution would be a peer-to-peer -peer connection. And as Daniel uh, also mentioned, that's not the problem is that this is not always possible because usually both sides are behind some nuts, which means my client, which wants to initiate the uh, uh, audio video streams uh, uh, connections uh, is not directly reachable by the, by the client of my contact. My client doesn't even know its own public IP address, so it can't even tell the contact client um, uh, what IP address to try to connect to. The solution for this latter part is contacting the stun server. Stun server, stun communication is just client asks the server, hello, what IP address am I using to connect to you? And the stun server uh, responds with the IP address as seen from the stun server. So that's usually the public IP address that the PS client might that the PS client might uh, try to connect to. Um, in many cases, with a little trickery on the client side, um, that's enough for both uh, for the clients to um, actually initiate to actually initiate then a peer to peer connection. And so, in these cases, that's about it as far as server side uh, support is uh, uh, concerned. Um, the client the, the, the client figures out its IP address and then goes on on its own by doing a peer to peer connection without without needing additional assistance by the server. The problem is um, this doesn't always work. This doesn't, there are not types. It depends on the uh, exact type of nut uh, the client sits behind. There are not types where this doesn't work because um, when the client asks the asks this stun server for its IP address, it might, the, the response might be different from the IP address that has to be used by the PS client. So, I see you're spamming my, <laughs> my XMPP client. I switched it off. <laughs> um, Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, uh, stun is not the solution for all nut types. And uh, in the cases where it doesn't work out, which in our experience is typically the case for um, mobile, uh, is typically the case when you're on a mobile network. In those cases, the fallback solution is to use turn to relay the stream uh, over the server. So, and that if we're in that situation, we we the, the clients figure out there's no way to uh, build the peer-to-peer -peer connection. They fall back to relaying everything over the server. Um, how do they figure this out? There's an um, RC called ICE which describes the mechanism for both sides to uh, negotiate the which type of connection peer-to-peer -peer, uh, or turn relaying is to be used. Um, they both clients start by gathering candidates, which is the ICE term for uh, address and port pairs that the remote side might try to connect to. Such a candidate can be either the client's local IP address, which is typically just the private IP address, uh, which is behind some nuts, so it won't work. Um, the another candidate can be the client's external IP address as returned by Stun, and the next uh, the next type of candidates is the turn service address that the remote client can connect to if everything else fails. This list of candidates is communicated communicated to the peer via Jingle, and uh, both sides will then attempt connecting to the list of candidates they receive. Uh, there's a complex uh, uh, the complex mechanisms of how to choose. I mean, they're, 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 you might end up with multiple uh, candidates uh, working, and um, uh, the the mechanisms to figure out which of those to use then are somewhat complex. But um, in the end, the the optimal solution is usually to prefer peer to peer over stone uh, uh, over turn. So, if peer to peer connections work, they will usually be chosen in the end. Um, either way. By the end of this uh, ne negotiation, the client should have a um, should have an actual connection they can use for transmitting the streams, and everything's fine. Um, but let's step one. Let's go one step back because 
The first problem, as Dan Daniel also mentioned on his last slide, is how to figure out which uh, Stone Return service to use. Um, the traditional solution was to, um, well, besides that was mentioned by Daniel, such as having the user explicitly configuring Stone Return servers or hard coding something. Uh, the proper traditional solution was to look up the Stone Return services in DNS. And uh, the next question then is how to authenticate against the turn server. Because as an operator, you don't want to uh, you don't want to offer a public anonymous turn service because that is basically just an open relay, if you would, an open proxy. Um, so you want to require authentication, and the question is how the client uh, would authentic would authenticate against your turn server. Uh, the traditional solution for authentication was to just reuse the XMP XMPP credentials, your uh, Java ID and password. Um, but these days, the problem with that is that this, uh, for turn, this only works if the uh, turn server has access to the plain text password, which these days for many servers is no longer the case. Often passwords are hashed on the server side, and a hashed password can't be used by turn for authentication, simply because the mechanism works as it does. It, uh, you don't actually <coughs> transmit passwords over the wire or something, but you uh, use the password to uh, generate an HMAC, and um, you can only do that if you have the uh, clear text password. So that's a problem, and that's the actual problem which um, which uh, led Daniel to go for another solution, which is the XAP he mentioned, uh, except no 0215. Um, where the idea is that it solves both problems I mentioned. It lists the available, the, the, the stun and turn services uh, uh, made available by the uh, server operator, and it offers temporary credentials to use for turn. Um, so, um, so in this case, you get around the, the, the uh, problem of uh, uh, your real credentials being hashed, you can just clear text, uh, produce some clear text passwords, which which expire within uh, the next few minutes, and be done with it. Um, this extension, which offers the credentials and lists the available services, was uh, missing from eJobD. Prosody had it for a longer time already, I think. Um, as a Prosody operator, you would use the uh, module more turn credentials and um, in combination with an external turn server, because the which you can do because the mechanism to um, generate the uh, temporary credentials is uh, based on some uh, ITF draft, which explains how to use a shared secret shared between more turn credentials and uh, an external turn server. Um, it's, it's it's the 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 temporary username and password are derived the, the temporary password is derived from the username and the shared secret so um we, we, this makes it possible to have uh, the xpp server have prosody and have coturn um that have prosody handout credentials which can be validated by uh coturn and uh the EJOD's module Modstone Disco implements the same thing. It's shipped with unit, unit 2004, uh, and then it's enabled by default. Um, and it actually does the same thing. The, in addition, you get uh, also now enabled by default an internal uh, stun and turn server with EJOD, but uh, as the same mechanism is used to derive the uh, credentials, you could also use an external turn server. For example, if you have already Coturn set up for uh, next cloud or whatever. Um, yeah, I figured I'd uh, go a little bit into the gory details of uh, turn relaying itself because whenever people ended up with uh, with connectivity trouble when playing with audio video, it was usually uh, due to the somewhat complex architecture of turn. So I figured I'd go into a little bit into the details because I think it helps to understand possible problems. Um, the main thing, the main point I think most users don't expect is that uh, with turn relaying, there's three parties involved. It's kind of an asymmetrical thing. Um, there's the turn server, 
obviously, and the client talking to the return server. And the third party is the peer. So it works like if I want to offer um, uh, turn relaying to my to my contact, I tell my turn server, hello. I, first of all, I contact my turn server using the uh, address and port I got from what uh, I, I got from the uh, exact 0215 communication. And then I ask my turn server to uh, allocate a relay that I can can use to to, uh, to relay the traffic from my peer. But what that means is the uh, asking my turn server to allocate a dedicated port, high port, um, that my peer can connect to. The connection from myself to the turn server can be either UDP connection or a TCP connection or a TLS connection. UCP or TCP is typically on port 3478, TLS on another part. Um, UDP is preferable because it has lower latency, but uh, TLS might be used as a fallback for bypassing firewalls, which won't allow UDP. But the, the connection my peer uses to connect to my turn server will always be a UDP connection on this high port. So this is the is why I said it's uh, kind of asymmetrical. Um, right, now we can, I said clients might, might want to use TLS to bypass the firewall. Now we can obviously have this situation where the context client is also behind a restricted firewall, in which case we might actually end up with both my own turn server and the peer's turn server being used. So we have an additional hop from me to my turn server to the peer's turn server back to his clients, and in that case, uh, uh, in that case, it's possible that both that we uh, uh, have a connection between both clients, despite both being behind a restricted firewall. So my client would connect to my turn server via TLS. The peer's client would connect to his turn server via TLS, and from my turn server's point of view, the peer's turn server is the turn peer, right? So the Turn servers would talk UDP to each other, but the connections to the clients could both be TLS. All connections I mentioned could be both IPv4 or IPv6 connect, uh, v6 connections, except that uh, LibWeb RTC doesn't actually support IPv6 for uh, the server to peer connection. So this would be um, this missing support can be another reason for us ending up with this additional hop where. Uh, suppose uh, I speak IP only. I speak only IPv4, while my uh, peer only speaks uh, vzx. Then he would end up. Uh, he would end up um, speaking vzx to his turn server. I would uh, speak v v4 to my turn server, and the turn service uh, would speak uh, v4 UDP uh, to each other. So that's. I just mainly wanted to mention that these uh, can totally happen. That both that you have the additional top uh, hop of both sides uh, using the using their own turn server. Yeah, that's actually it already. Um, just as a final note, I figured I'd mention that we those who joined uh, the video conference are using Jitsi Meet, which is based actually on the uh, same technologies uh, we mentioned. Uh, the Jitsi Meet client is using uh, Jingle to talk to the uh, Jitsi Meet server. Um, they're using WebRTC, and uh, the difference is that obviously that the there's a server component. Uh, the difference to audio video is, is done by conversations, um, and the server component makes takes takes most of the connectivity issues we mentioned uh, away, as you can, as the server doesn't usually sit behind some uh, NAT or restricted firewall, and so the server is usually reachable and solves these problems. But other than that, it's uh, I just wanted to mention that it's basically uh, the same te technology beneath. Yeah, questions? Um, should we do uh, ETA's talk first? Ah, right, yeah. Okay, if, if there's, yeah, sure. If there's no immediate question, then that's a good idea. ETA uh, offered to talk about, um, sorry, uh, to talk about his work on integrating the audio video solution with our stories. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to hear that.
All right. Um, can you hear me? Is this working? Looks like it. Um, gives me a moment to. So there we go. Looks like I've managed to successfully screen share something. Perfect. Right. So basically, I so a bit, a bit of background to this talk. Um, I heard sort of about the Daniel implementing the new AV support and conversations. I thought this is great. Um, but I don't actually have any conversations using friends. I mostly use sort of bridges and things, but I do use the, the public switch telephone network, the PSTN. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually make a real phone call with my XMPP client and have incoming phone calls? Because it, conversations is quite a nice UI for receiving phone calls. It integrates with system dialer and everything. So I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could actually have calls from my real phone number come through in conversations? So I decided to use asterisk, asterisk for this. It's a free open source PBX that I'd heard of previously. And it actually, it's, it's really nice. It has support for SIP. They did a whole bunch of work to add WebRTC support and pretty much everything Daniel and Holger have ever talked about is like already in the code base there. And it even has a nice XMPP implementation um, for sort of sending messages and stuff. So the idea is if you were building something on SIP, you could have it ping your um, users of XMPP to notify them of an incoming call or something. So it did have an XMPP module. And in fact, it even had a jingle module um, that had a channel driver called Chan Motif, uh, where like a channel driver is basically asterisk speak for something you can place calls through and receive calls through. And so I thought we're in business, you know, I can just install asterisk and you know I can connect it. I has I can connect it to some SIP accounts. There's a wonderful service called jmp.chat, which um, lets you get a US number by paying, I think three quid a month or something. And there's also, I also use callwithus.com who give really, really cheap international calling rates. And so I thought I can connect Asterisk to some SIP trunks. That's already, you know, there's lots of um, tutorials online on how to do that. And then I can sort of connect to XMPP on the other side and figure out some way to initiate calls from XMPP. So maybe the idea is you kind of send a, a text message to say, you know, dial this number and then it calls you back. Um, because, I mean, you could, I'll get into this later, um, you could press the call button in conversations and sort of call that way, but then you'd have difficulty actually entering the number you wanted to call, because rather understandably, there's no implementation of sort of a number pad. You can't input numbers and have them come out as DTMF terms. Um, so I essentially, hang on, I think I've got myself lost. There we go. So, and then I actually look at, looked at Chan Motif. It's from, it's from 2012. It's, it still had references uh, in the code base to sort of Google style jingles. So I had a whole bunch of sort of if defs and things for, are we using really, really damn old jingle or are we using the sort of the standardized version? Um, so it needed a lot of work to actually, well, okay, not that much work. It needed some work in order to actually make it work with modern day conversations. I tried initiating a call and I instantly got an error message back saying you need to support DTLS SRTP. Um, so I sort of looked at the code base a bit and hacked it around. And eventually I sort of managed to add that in. You just add a fingerprint element to the stanza. And then, well, the, so the nice thing about this is because all the work to do WebRTC features had been done in Asterisk already, it was simply a matter of wiring up the jingle signaling to the Asterisk internal API calls. So in fact, I could copy a lot of the code from the SIP module, for example, when and just I saw how they did it for things like DTLS and just sort of modified it to work with the XMPP code. And the other thing conversations wanted was RTCP marks. So that's sort of a thing where you send your control signals in the same stream as the audio video signals, so you don't have to open tons of connections to your peer. And it also, it, I think it was its idea of how jingle session initiate works was slightly outdated. It thought you could initiate the session and then send the transport later. Conversations wouldn't have any of that and it would just error out. So we fixed that as well. Eventually this came up with this patch set, which is downloadable at that URL, uh, which applies nicely and cleanly over asterisk 16.7. Uh, there's also a Docker container, which I'll probably sort of publish more formally at some point. Um, because I'm, in fact, I, I ran this in Kubernetes and Docker on my personal infrastructure. So it was, yeah, I, I mainly consume this via Docker. And I would like to say at this point, thanks to Daniel for including some sensible error messages in conversations, because without that, I'm pretty sure I'd have been, um, I would not have known what was wrong. 
but you know you could see right there in the XML stream, oh, support for DTLS is required. Okay, let's go do that. Oh, you've missed this attribute. Okay, let's go fix that, which is quite nice. Um, so to actually to actually build something, this this is this is somewhat surprising asterisk um, like mini language called a dial plan. Um, with the idea is you kind of specify extensions and then like what you what should happen on those extensions when people call them. And in fact, it even thinks XMPP messages are kind of like, uh, it, it doesn't really. Basically, when you send it an XMPP message, it treats it the same way as a phone call. So except you can use some of these variables um, highlighted and um, or italicized variables to get information about the message. Um, so basically, you have to learn this asterisk DSL. And you can see there's this is a simple dial plan context, which, well, simple, which you send it a message. Um, it sends you a message via XMPP saying, I'm going to give an echo test call. And then it calls, it shells out to this um, place call.sh, which I'll go on to later. And it calls, so you see motive slash jingle slash and then the XMPP um, JID and resource. Um, and then the, extent, the asterisk extension to connect it to. And that goes and places an outgoing call uh, via jingle and connects it to that asterisk extension. Um, because essentially, you can't, this is just, you've just received a message. You can't then go and dial from this context because it doesn't, you haven't actually got an audio stream yet. So you need this shell script, which then goes and essentially places a file in asterisk's um, spool directory to say, please initiate an outgoing call to um, please, the, the, the sort of channel variable over there is who do you want to call? And you say which extension you want to patch it to and what's the caller ID and things like that. And so essentially, if you, if you run that shell script, then it'll actually initiate an outgoing call. And so I thought, OK, we've got an echo test. Or more on that later. Um, how about actually calling real world phone numbers? So I managed to get that working as well. Essentially, I made it so that you could send it a, a command like sort of dial in the phone number. And then it would it would run that same place called the sh again, except this time it would, instead of dialing a sort of uh, in the previous slide, extension 400 is just an extension I created for the echo test purposes. Um, whereas now, now it would let you specify extensions. So you could actually set up elsewhere in a dial plan. You could say, OK, dial 9 followed by an actual phone number. And then you can actually type dial 9 and then a real sort of PSTN phone number. And it would go and connect you to um, via call with us or via JMP. And actually, you'd be able to place a phone call. And I mean, here are some screenshots of what it looks like using the wonderful Conversations UI to sort of prove that I'm not lying. This does actually work. I would do a demo, but the first law of demos is they never work. So, and it would also be quite hard to get working under Jitsi, so you'll have to take my work for it. But it does work, which is quite nice. Um, there are some things. There are some things to work on. So, as Daniel was saying in his talk, um, there's this fancy extension called Jingle Message Initiation. Um, instead, of, so which is basically you can send a regular XMPP message and have multiple devices pick up on that. And in fact, I mean, Conversations kind of wants to use that. And in the latest betas, uh, they've now added a feature which lets you directly do a jingle initiation instead of sending a message saying, will you do some jingle at some point in the future? But then again, we've got that issue of how do you even input a number over this scheme? So even if you could dial directly, you still have to figure out some way of specifying an external phone number. Other things I'd like to do is maybe we'll mainline the patch. I mean, currently, it's a dot .patch file on my website. But it would be nice if this were included in asterisk mainline so that that um, tram motif channel driver worked for everyone. And they wouldn't have to sort of find out that um, you need to install a custom patch for it. And I mean, also, I was noticing someone was speaking in the muck about um, video conferencing. Asterisk does actually have video support. And I mean, the, the code for it is there in the channel driver. I just haven't, I hadn't um, experimented with it yet, and I sort of saw no reason to get it working. But that could be also an interesting avenue for further development, because it could um, potentially enable you to use Asterisk's built-in video conferencing functionality to do group video calls with conversations, which, is, which would be quite nice. But anyway, um, that's it from me. Here are some contact details, including my XMPP JID. And most importantly, if you look at the thing in red, if you send the word test me, or lowercase, to asterisk at theta.eu.org, it should, keyword should, give you a nice um, jingle call. And then you'll, you'll sort of listen to a thing where it says, this is an echo test channel. And then you can say stuff and have it said back to you, and it's all great. So if you, if you like me, are 
sort of sitting there with the conversations AV support and unclear what to actually do with it, then maybe that's something you can do to sort of test your setup and satisfy yourself that it does, does actually work. Although, as Holger said, you might actually need a turn server. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take questions or sort of hand the mic to everyone, anyone else if they want to say anything. Uh, yeah, I actually have a question if no one else uh, has one. Um, so in terms of entering the number or in terms of like user experience, I imagine that having JITs that are like some phone number at asterisk.mydomain.tld, that would be but like, like having asterisk like not be a bot, but a gateway, if you will, that would probably be nice UX. Is that something that you're either like interested in or do you have a feeling that would be hard to do with Asterix? Uh, no, actually, no, it is a good idea. And I did, you're right, I did actually think about that. Um, well, I think that there, there are two main problems with it that I see with doing it that way. The first is that the, the Asterix code is not, it wouldn't be ready to do a component connection at all, I don't think. So you'd need to... I get you need to like add a lot of conditionals everywhere. I need to sort of do a fairly extensive rewrite to incorporate the possibility of doing things that way, because currently it is it's very oriented toward having a single bot or single connection. But yeah, no, that would be the ideal goal. Um, I suppose the other thing is even if you had this, there's a bit of echo. Uh, even if you had this set up, um, arguably the UX of having to sort of add a custom JIT to a roster is perhaps not as nice as just talking to a bot. Um, but I guess, I mean, that's something you could look into. And you could probably even add custom client-side support for that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's theoretically possible. Um, it's just a lot of work. And at least for me, there's not that much reward. OK, any other questions like on anything, I guess? Um, yeah, actually, if you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. OK. Um, I have a small question. Um, and uh, that is, I did some testing with conversations and Movin. And it appears that uh, Movin was not able to establish a connection with XMPP, uh, if Movin, uh, if the device running Movin doesn't have a webcam, and my question was, uh, is there or does does the the uh, the Jingo uh, stack on XMPP require both devices to send video, or can you do uh, video only in one direction, for example? Is that also possible? Um, well, on a protocol level, that would be possible, I guess. Um, but I'm honestly not quite sure how conversations would behave. Um, we, we previously fixed some bugs um, for video-only sessions. Um, but but I guess I mean if if you just want to make it work, just have an audio call, and that should just work anyway. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know what would happen if you like, for example, like use conversations to try to make a video call to move them and move them is on a on a PC that doesn't have a webcam. Um, but yeah, maybe like open a bug report on uh, either move them and. Um, conversations and then we will um, figure out uh, what would be necessary to fix that issue or whatever. Okay, um, and then another question, uh, is it possible to uh, upgrade an audio only call to a video call somehow? Um, again, on a protocol level, that's totally possible um, for uh, Conversations. I deliberately decided not to do that uh, because I feel like the UX is very different. Like, for example, like on 
in one of the cases, you might hold your phone to your ear and stuff like that, and you can't really do that uh, with video calls. So it would be very weird. And also, like the button arrangement and everything, it's all a little bit different. So um, yeah, I I decided on purpose not to implement it. Uh, and if, if you want to do that, just hang up and, and dial again. But yeah, for what it's worth, the, the protocol could could do it. Okay, that basically answers my question. Thank you. Uh, um, for those uh, joining us or watching us on YouTube, um, you can join, what, what is this, uh, Berlin minus meetup at conference.conversations.im, or uh, click the link in the video descriptions, and then you can also ask uh, questions on the XMPP channel, or if you want to ask them live on air, you can also join us via Jitsi to ask your questions. And yeah, you should be able to, I guess, find the link to Jitsi in the video description as well. Um, do we have other questions at this point before I start looking into the chat? Okay, doesn't seem like it, so I'm just <laughs> gonna keep on talking. Um, someone in the channel, like previously, asked about uh, conferences, and um, so the general thing about conferences is that um, I mean, in general, there are two ways of doing that. So I mean, the, the very naive thing or, or or dumb thing in a way would be to um, set up a conference where like each participant opens like WebRTC connections to every other participant. Um, that kind of scales for, um, for all your connections, for all your only connections with only a few participants, but for anything that involves more participants or involves um, video streams, you always need some sort of uh, server-side component or something that, that lives on the server where you no longer use peer-to-peer -peer connections, but each peer sends it to the server and then the server like redistributes the stream down to um, everyone else. Um, and yeah, so, so either you would have to write that server component yourself or base it up on something pre-existing. If you wanted to base it on something pre-existing, like two pro probable solutions would come to mind. Uh, first is obviously Jitsi Meet. I mean, Jitsi Meet already uses XMPP. Um, so um, naively, you could assume that it um, might be relatively simple to quote unquote, just join a meet, Jitsi Meet call um, with conversations. And then in a later iteration, you wouldn't even need like Jitsi Meet anymore. It could just be like a bunch of conversations engaged in a Jitsi Meet call or in the server side component of, of Jitsi Meet. Um, and um, there are even um, ZEPs that um, specify how you would then talk with the uh, server side component and how the server side component like manages all the participants and stuff like that. Um, and those steps are kinder implemented um, uh, in Jitsi Meet. Uh, and if you want to um, uh, Google that, the keyword here is Colibri. That's, that's some sort of acronym. I actually don't know what for, but the step is called Colibri. Someone can maybe post the link in the channel. And that's the step that was originally also created by the Jitsi people. Um, but then Jitsi Meet like kind of evolved from there, and they didn't like they didn't keep updating the ZEP, and so um, Jitsi Meet uses like a slight dialect of that, and it's not really like documented anywhere. And um, I also like asked the Jitsi Meet people like a month ago if they were interested in working with me on um, making it possible to. Uh, 
to use conversations to join a Jitsi Meet call. And yeah, the answer was they are not. Um, I think that I kind of like worried about having their brand being spoiled by other bad implementations or something like that. Um, so yeah, so uh, so their current implementation of CZ is, isn't really documented anywhere. So you would have to like reverse engineer that. And then if worse comes to worse, like even potentially fork like these server side components from Jitsi Meet because they might be developing like in a different direction that you don't like. And then you have to like maintain it yourself. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, long story short, it, it would theoretically be possible. And the client side code of that um, would probably not even be um, that involved. Um, but yeah, someone would have to like maintain the server side component or like reverse engineer like the Jitsi meet dialect of the Zap. Or yeah, I don't know. Maybe like I haven't looked into Asterix as well. Uh, well, I haven't looked into Asterix yet. Like maybe they're all a little bit more friendly on the open documentation or stuff like that. Um. But but yeah, I mean that's what it would take to um, uh, bring uh, video conferences to to conversations and the XMPP ecosystem, I guess. So I have a question: Who are those Jitsi Meet people? So they are not interested in XMPP, so not interested in recontributing. But who are they? Is it a company? I think it's uh, Ragtag. There's, there's a company called 8x8 that develop it, and then they sell it as a proprietary version as well. OK. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of uh, information on that. I, I guess, like, originally, they are coming a little bit from the um, XMPP ecosystem, or they were previously more involved with the XMPP ecosystem. Uh, and, and, and do, you know some, like, do you know some of them? Uh, no, not personally. Um, but like, I think originally it was like a French company or like some of the people are French, but, but the company also has like a strange history. Like oh, for a couple of years, they belonged to Atlassian, like uh, HipChat and stuff like that. But then um, Atlassian stopped HipChat development and I guess then they also got rid of like the Jitsi company and then Jitsi got bought by, by someone else. Um, so yeah, their origins are definitely with the XMPP verse, but they are, yeah, yeah. Were they Don't for example that interested on, anymore? Were they for example in the XSF MOOC or even in, on the board or something like that? Oh, historically, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, but, but, yeah, one of the involved people, right? So he was quite active in the community and kind of still is a bit. Um, Can you repeat? I, I didn't hear I, the I beginning. Be one of the guys who worked on Jitsi a lot in the past, I, I think he, I still see him in uh, committing to a Jitsi meet these days. Um, he's, I don't know of others, but, but at, at least him was definitely active in the community, yes. Um, yeah, and I mean, given that the video bridge is originally was written for to support the uh, Jitsi desktop video conferencing feature, and Jitsi desktop is a an uh, XMPP client. Yes, obviously, as Daniel said, in the uh, in the past, they clearly were the focus. Uh, they they clearly were uh, uh, XMPP interested. And yes, I would agree. It looks a bit like these days they are not. That's that's where they're coming from, and so they're sitting on a solution that's using XMPP. But uh, maybe they would prefer not to. <laughs> Thanks for those answers. Um, to the people in the chat, if you had questions, um, just ask them again, so I don't have to scroll up, I guess.
Okay, someone on the um, chat said that there were no other questions. Okay, way less questions than I expected, but that's fine. So maybe okay, we can. one question. If you can, and now a bit about Daniel, please refer to the Gadgem implementation and how this matches or not to the conversations, implementation, and or thoughts. This is asked by Felix. Um, yes. Um, so, yeah, the question was about Gadgem and potential compatibility with Gadgem in the future. And the short answer to that is I don't know. Um, I wasn't even able to like trigger a call in Gadgem, so I couldn't like even look into like the XML that uh, Gadgem would produce to like figure out what it would be using. And so Gadgem also by default or in my installation didn't add any um, disco features to it from which I could learn um, what. Um, yeah, what flavor of jingle it supports. Um, so yeah, I I I just today asked uh, a love taxi developer of Gadgem if he knows more more on that. And apparently, um, you first have to install some additional packages and stuff like that uh, on Gadgem um, to even make like the disco features or the call button appear. But I haven't done that yet. So yeah, I I, I just don't know. Um, I wouldn't have a lot of hopes uh, on that at the current point, though. So, but I'm 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 really not basing that on anything. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, and someone is asking about JS, uh, JSTX, um, so the other um, JavaScript or web client for XMPP. Uh, and I don't know because I actually don't have a test installation for that. So if, if someone can provide me with like some test credentials uh, to, to JSTX, uh, implementation. I'm happy to like um, figure it out. Uh, but because this is a web client, it will almost definitely use libwebrtc. And like traditionally, it was always relatively easy to be compatible with other um, libwebrtc clients. Um, so yeah, if someone actually like has a has an installation of that that they could give me access to, um, I'd actually be like relatively confident that it either like works directly out of the box or that we could make it work like relatively easily. Uh, okay, it seems there are no further questions. Um, then, yeah, I, I guess um, um, thank you all for joining us, Isa and Jitsi, on Google uh, or, or on, on YouTube. And usually this is the point where we uh, move this meeting to a bar, which unfortunately uh, we can't. Uh, but, yeah, I guess if you want, like, keep sticking around in, in the channel and... Yeah, also note that the Berlin XMPP meetup is a thing that happens like regularly every month. And so, yeah, we will be meeting again or like people will be meeting again like next month and maybe at some point in the future also like in person in, in Berlin. And yeah, I, I guess uh, thanks again, everyone who joined and like to Holger and Eta for further talks. Yeah, and uh, thank you for uh, doing all the work and bringing audio and video to XMPP. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for the talks. And also in other cities, we have meetups like I heard from Munich, Dresden, and Hamburg. Uh, some other cities I don't, I'm not aware of. You could add them now. Uh, so I hope it will not be virtual in the future. Yes, thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks a lot, everyone. See you.